and welcome to everyone to the Stannery Murray Sandini Chambol Moussini Zoom tasting. Uh, this was one I was particularly keen to, to do myself uh, from the very outset. Uh, I did luck or not, I don't know, but we were particularly strong in Maurice Saint-Denis. And uh, we're lucky enough to work with some of the great growers of Maurice Saint-Denis, and it's always had a particularly fond place in my heart. We've assembled another all-star cast tonight for it. Um, we have from the US of A, William Kelly, a wine advocate, joining us. Um, his notes don't come out until January, but we'll look forward to those. But I've just learned also that he does make a little bit of wine in Chambol Moussini. So he's extremely well placed to talk about that. My friend and colleague, Master Sommelier Gary Devani, uh, will be taking us through a couple of wines. And then three winemakers, uh, Australian turned Burgundian Mark Heisman, um, and then two men who traverse Chambol and Maurice Saint Denis, uh, Cyprien Arlo and Romain Topineau. Uh, so we'll try and get everything in, five wines to think about. Um, and if we could start off with you, William, if that's okay, and if I could ask you to give us an overview of 19 as a vintage, and then more specifically your thoughts on how Chambol and Maury fared in 19. Thanks very much. Sure. So um, I think it's it's interesting to make the comparison between 19 uh, and 18 because they're both sunny, warm years. Uh, Soleil vintages, they, they call them in, in, in French. And uh, I've already had a lot of questions about how do, how do 19s compare to 18s? Um, 18s rather blocky, chunky, ripe, powerful wines. How do, how do 19s fit in? Um, so, so even though they're, that they, have, they share these qualities of being solaire vintages, as, as the French put it, um, I think they're actually rather different. And it's important to emphasize that the style of the wines um, I find tasting is, is extremely different. Uh, firstly, uh, 2019 wasn't as hot or as sunny. Um, 2018 was about 30% more sunshine hours than an average vintage, whereas 2019 only 20% more. So not quite as extreme. Uh, I think it was cooler, especially then during the spring. And this is, this is rather important for for the character of the vintage too because um especially around the time of flowering the weather was a, was a little inclement uh flowering was uneven um extended protracted so little shot berries uh lower yields whereas if 18 especially on the white side of the ledger was characterized by above average um even rather extreme yields uh then 2019 was much more a vintage of lower yields below average yields uh, I think the other really interesting distinction for me is in those last couple of weeks before the harvest itself, uh, what you had rather than in, in 18 where things kind of sort of baked and got pretty hot, uh, in 19 you had instead um, uh, a drying wind. Uh, so that the reason the sugar levels were going up was because of this drying wind somewhat dehydrating the fruit. Now that concentrated uh, sugars, uh, concentrated the flavor, but also concentrated acidity. So typically, again, I mean, you know, this varies on a case by case basis. And it's difficult to make these kinds of generalizations, but um, 19, and this is certainly my experience with the wines I made in, in Chambol versus 18, 19 had lower pHs, uh, similar alcohol levels. So they're both, uh, you know, we're talking about above average alcohol levels, but better acidities, fresher, more dynamic fruit flavors above all. Um, and that's something that numbers don't necessarily always communicate. Uh, and also, you know, rather less uh, saturated, inky um, levels, of, levels of extraction coming naturally. I mean, again, I found making a bit of a bit of wine in both those vintages 2018 from the from the very start was was um, black you know and you didn't have to do anything in 18 to make very um, structured extracted wines with, with huge anthocyanin indices um, 2019 has always been again from that very first moment in, in uh, of cuvaison when you put the grapes in a tank and you see the first juice um, you can tell an awful lot in it and already uh, 19 from the very beginning throughout the whole cuvaison was extraordinarily charming so um, if you were to make analogies, you know, people, there's no perfect analogy for, for anything and every vintage is, is unique, but um, those caveats being as they may, I'd say uh, 19 has some of the, the warmth and generosity and, and substance and richness of 15, um, with also a lot of the charm, liveliness, energy, expression of 17. So the ones that sort of burst out of the glass, but they do have a bit more body, a bit more matter, a bit more uh, color, a bit more texture than 17s. Uh, I think it's a very winning um, combination for, for the red wines. Um, the white wines, 
a little bit more extreme, a little bit more variable as well, because we're talking about, about particularly low yields in white, low yields of juice as well, uh, whereas 18, in some, some, to some extent, you could say 18 uh, was saved by the high yields because in warm conditions like that, it was only having large yields in white that prevented the wines becoming very, very ripe and, and um, exotic and rich in character. In 19, um, there are some rather rich exotic wines. There are wines where you can feel the alcohol a bit, absolutely. Um, this is slightly off topic, of course, given that we're not really tasting any white wines tonight, but it's worth saying. Um, however, the best, I think, also very exciting wines which have a lot of acidity, a lot of alcohol, a lot of extract, a lot of everything. Um, and and, it, and in, in the best examples, it works very well. A couple of things we've touched on, William, in, in past Zooms, which I'd love your perspective on. Um, you've, you've likened them to more modern vintages and, and people have asked, well, what, what about further back? And there's been talk of we're in a new modern era of Burgundy and it's, it's really hard to compare them to past vintages because the world is so different and, and Burgundy's in a different place. And another theme that people have been keen to hear about is, is just how good is the vintage um, and we'll be putting Cyprien on the spot when it comes to his term, because I, I think he's gone on the record at this early stage of saying his 19s are the best wines he's ever made and better than his 10s. Um, we'll talk yeah, to I, about that, but where, where do you stand on those? No, I mean, I, I um, obviously, there are precedents for, for all of the, the things that, that we see in the last three vintages, these extreme vintages. I mean, I think 2003 remains more extreme than any of the three that we've just had. Um, so it's not, it's not without precedent. I think you can find precedents also in 15, in 03, in 09, uh, in 05 of the sorts of vintages we, we've just had in succession. Uh, that being said, um, what is really unusual is to have three vintages like 18, 19 and 20 back to back. I mean, that I don't think you can ever, you can't find in the, in the history books, at least not as far back as I've been. Um, but, 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 you know, I, I, I think there, there are more parallels in some ways if you go back to the immediate post-war vintages where you're looking at, in the case of, say, 45, 47, 49, rather ripe vintages with low yields. Uh, because in the interim, we've had fertilizers, we've had clones, we've had um, all sorts of approaches in the vineyards that created... Um, very different kinds of grapes uh, and i wonder i wonder in some respects if we're if we're seeing grapes that have more in common with the sort of things you saw in say 1937 l'angeville's 1937s were all above 14 percent alcohol so there, there are precedents for these things but um there's been a lot of a lot of evolution since um those older vintages in terms of the way grapes are grown wines and made that, that that i think contribute as much as any kind of shift in the climate to the way that, to, to the fact that the wines are rather different um, you wanted some specific sort of thoughts about Sh Chambon and, and um, Moray. I don't know. I think there were a couple of hail episodes in, in the 19 vintage that, that impacted some places, but not, you know, ultimately, I think it's, I think it's broad brushstrokes, rather similar picture along the Côte de Nuit. Um, you could say there's a little bit more rainfall in Moray, but not enough to make a, a profound difference. I, I think it's much more important what kind of rootstocks you're on, how deep your soils are, how old your vines are, than if you have uh, five millimeters more rain than, than the neighboring commune, frankly. Um, so I don't think there are any, for, for me, it's a rather consistent picture that's, that's patterned more by winemaking choices um, and, and, and harvest date decisions and, and farming methods than any kind of you know, you can say that Gevray was like this and Moray was like that. I don't, I don't think that rings true. I mean, it's a perfect example. My favorite example, 2019, uh, Eshazer, Charles Lachaud made an Eshazer barely 13% alcohol. Emmanuel Rouget made an Eshazer that's 16.2. Now they're both Eshazer, they're both 2019. How do we generalize about Eshazer? Uh, what we're really talking about is not variation caused by the vintage. We, we call, we're talking about producer choices, uh, accumulated producer choices, not just harvest date, but principally that, but, but a lot of other things too. Sarah wants to take us away from Chambol and Mori possibly already, but if, if, as a quick answer, any villages aside from the ones we're talking about tonight that you thought particularly overperformed in 19? I mean, I think it was a great uh, year to be in cooler places or places with deeper, more water retentive soils. Uh, I think it's not a bad vintage to get to buy, find, find some nicely priced Chorée or, or explore the oat coat. I mean, it's a great vintage to explore the oat coat, frankly. So, so uh, um, I, I think, you know, in, in some of those, a lot of those distinctions between, between site um, that you can see so strongly in the 70s, for example, with, to do with some places had ripe grapes and others didn't. You know, I think today, vintage like 2019, it's possible to ripen grapes anywhere in Burgundy, more or less. 
you know, even Alagate, north facing high altitude can ripen uh, to, to, to maybe even 12% alcohol, you know, <laughs> so, so and that was just not the case in the 70s. So you're, you're, w w the site distinctions, now we're looking at real sort of shadings of you know, the effect of exposition, altitude, soil types on the wines, but it's not, it's not a radical, you know, di flagrant division between places w that were able to ripen grapes and those that didn't. So I think it's a great time to explore, um, you know, explore other parts of Burgundy, um, lesser known appellations, especially if you can find some places where people are farming really well and, and making serious efforts, because I think that's the going to be the, the the acid test for the future of Burgundy, um, rather than, you know, where location, I think farming is, 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 is super important. William, thank you very much. It's probably on that a good time to bring Mark in, if we may. Um, and you, you made reference to sites that perform well in the modern warmer, warmer. And I think, Mark, you might say what we're tasting here in the Eschazo is, is a vineyard that, that perfor has performed better than it would have done in cooler times. But if, if I could ask you to say a little bit about your history and about what we've got in the glass and, and yeah, over to you. Lovely, thank you very much, Sam. And uh, thank you everybody for joining tonight. Um, my very strong Burgundian accent, I hope doesn't confuse too many people, uh, but uh, I'm clearly not from Burgundy and uh, have come to Burgundy only 10 years ago to uh, start my career as a winemaker in, in Burgundy after 10 years in Australia making wines off my own vineyards in Australia. Um, so uh, for me coming to, to Burgundy, uh, it very much still is, I dare say will continue to be um, uh, a boy in a, in a lolly shop. Uh, I get to uh, see things that for the first time, uh, I get to continue making wines from vineyards that I've been working with since uh, I began in 2009. Uh, and every year is, is, is the greatest experience I have. <laughs> um, but that's uh, my inexperience, I think, uh, in, in this great area. Um, and, but also uh, a great thrill to, to be seen uh, different vintages perform in different ways. Um, so, uh, uh, the wine I've got tonight here with you guys is Chambol Musini uh, Les Echezeaux. Uh, it's a first time for me. Um, it's, a, it's a beautifully placed site. Um, I had an option on two barrels from here or four barrels from lower down on the slopes in uh, Chambol. Uh, and I, I jumped at the two barrels. Um, the site of Eshazo is beautifully protected, I think, um, from, from a warmer site lower down. Uh, and I felt we could very much um, capture the, the freshness and brightness uh, and energetic feel of Pinot Noir that I so uh, enjoy drinking. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very lazy, in fact, as a, as a, as a winemaker and um, if, if I have to think correctively as a winemaker, I feel like I'm, I'm working too hard um, and to do as little as possible in the, in, in, in with my winemaking, um, I feel I'm making a better expression of, of what these vineyards can do. So uh, for me, this is my first one from this vineyard, we continue uh, at the moment, and I hope we can maintain that relationship with, with the growers. Um, so that was really, really a great treat. So it's, it's, a, it's an easterly facing slope. It's high um, above the, uh, in the commune, uh, next to the village on the north side of the, of the village itself. Um, it, it's, a, it's a decent slope without being too steep uh, with some uh, good deep soils. Uh, I think we are protected a little bit from maybe the later warmer afternoon sun um, and I think in these vintages it, it could it can it does uh, produce some very elegant wine. I've all, often thought um, and not only with this vineyard uh, I'm working with other vineyards high above Volnay uh, in the Volnay uh, village level I've always admired these higher sites uh, and what we can, what we can find 
uh, in the Pinot Noir. Um, and I think this, this shows that slightly cooler, cooler, fresher feel uh, in the Pinot Noir. Um, so yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, very much in my style. Um, I'm not looking for high extraction or uh, um, uh, forced tannins. Um, I'm very much looking for a, a gentler feel in the Pinot Noir. Um, and uh, we use uh, no new oak, uh, but uh, good second use, uh, second wine uh, wood. Um, and uh, I like to use a bit of whole bunch, but it's not a, it's not a, a, a major thing, 50, 40, 50 percent. Um, and uh, an élevage in wood of, of 12 months. Um, so uh, a, a, a very standard, I suppose, well, what is standard, but for me, very, a very uh, standard uh, process in the winery. Yeah. So I, 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 I love it. So it's, it's like a, a dream come true to be able to get hold of a, of a slice of, um, of, of Burgundy like this and uh, all the other vineyards I, I have access to are, are, a great, are a great thrill. Yeah. And Mark, historically, am I right in saying it was classified slightly above the village level? Well, um, that story. Th we, we, there is a map in circulation where where the colouring seems to suggest that th this might have been a Premier Crew, but it definitely has no Premier Crew status now. Um, now, how how things were in 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 the uh, eighteen sixty, I believe. Um, but you know, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it as a as a level of Premier Crew <laughs> and run with it. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, it's it's a great treat to be able to get this quality of of vineyard. So, uh, um, yeah, if there's a a shaded history to the vineyard, I'm I'm going to take it all. <laughs> and a, a final question for you before you go on to Garrett: the, the vintage itself, nineteen um, for you. Ah, uh, it's it, like I say, for me, every vintage is an absolute treat. It's an absolute delight, an honor, a privilege to to be making wines in Burgundy. Uh, I, I feel like I'm, I'm living, living my dream. So for me, uh, for me, they're all fantastic. And uh, I do feel we are in a golden era of Burgundy. I don't have the history of the, 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 uh, the esteemed makers I'm sharing the panel with. Um, I, I don't have that history, but for me, I feel that we can make lovely, beautiful, expressive, gorgeous, stunning Pinot um, uh, nearly every year at the moment. If we are attentive to the season, we are uh, willing to, to be reactive and to pick our timings and to be uh, a little more... Um, imaginative maybe in our viticulture and how we may uh, create uh, uh, a circumstance where the, the vineyard can be a little cooler um, in the fruiting zone to, to help us retain some acidity. So for me, 19, uh, for me, I call it my classic numbers. Um, I think the numbers are fantastic. We had a beautiful pH, which kept great freshness allowed immaculate fermentations, clean, precise fermentations. Um, we, we, we keep a bright acidity. We also have a beautiful maturity uh, and an elegance in, in the Pinot Noir. And I think that's a, a really commendable uh, set of uh, positives that we can find in 2019. So, um, I started picking uh, on the 11th of September. We picked the Chambol on the 16th. Uh, so we were, you know, nicely ripe. Um, and I finished in Saint-Romain on the 20th. So uh, 19 for me, uh, I, I love it. I think there's so much to be uh, happy with. 18 uh, I, was a difficult one for me. I, I kept wanting to pull the trigger and then I, I backed off and certainly with Chardonnay, I think it was a very difficult vintage to, to get right on the money. Um, and we had to really think about it. 
2019, I drank a lot of beer and had a great time. It was a, it was a good, fun, easy, easy vintage to make. So, um, yeah, I, I, I loved it. And really, those kind of vintages bring them on. Ian compliments the poise and balance of the wine. Yeah, I, we, we, all, we all at this level, I think, are, uh, we need to um, assume our wines are coming with balance and poise and beauty. Um, uh, I come to Burgundy to make these kinds of wines. I go to Cornas to make wines with a little more structure and body. Uh, um, so for me, Pinot is, is what it should be. So that's, that's, I'm really, really, really pleased with 19. Uh, I, I think someone else is gonna say it, but uh, for me, these are the, the, the wines, my most favorite set of wines I've made in Burgundy so far. It's only been 10 years, but uh, you know, I'm gonna uh, stick my hat right on this vintage. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I, think, I think people who, who were conscious of what was going on in 19, I think have nailed some really delicious Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Thank you, Mark. Um, now, if I may pass on to Garrett to step into the, the big shoes of Thibaut. Um, over to you, Garrett. Um. Thankfully, not his dancing shoes, which would be even better to fill. So that's, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, we're going to taste the wine from Tiba. And, oh, just before I go on, Mark, congratulations. That wine is stunning. I just got the chat. Um, fantastic. Beautiful wine. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, Tibo, a larger-than-life character who, yeah, I mean, as much an amazing winemaker, and, but someone who's also someone I always seek out at any pole for, uh, for singing and dancing. He's a larger-than-life character, and I'm so happy that we work with him. Thibaut is now 20 years, I think, on his project. Uh, took over an old um, family uh, property back in 01. And uh, from the very offset, farming biodynam biodynamically, um, using uh, horses and plowing. Uh, so taking real care in the vineyard. Uh, I think all of the, the winemakers we have on here tonight and a lot of the winemakers that we work with at Stannery, uh, Flint Stannery, uh, are very much looking at how much time they spend working in the vineyard and the vineyard work being the real key in terms of getting good quality wines at the end of the journey. Um, this particular wine is, uh, it's a blend of parcels. So it's Vievine, so all vines, um, but it's five, five parcels around the village. Um, and I think this year, I didn't get to visit Tebow, but Jason told me he used some, some stems, about 50% of stems uh, in this particular thing, uh, this particular wine. Uh, and as we alluded to in one or two of the other um, webinars, with the with the lightness of the stems, they did help bring some freshness in, into the wines because there was that concentration. Um, so let's have a let's have a taste. Right. I think every testing that we do, sort of confirming. Uh, what I thought when I was down in Burgundy early this year for a week. Um, these are wines with real purity of fruit, real, ex real expression of, of Pinot, um, and also really showing sense of place. You know, that when you're tasting Chambon Musini, you want that sort of softness and elegance and, you know, that sort of um, yeah, real sort of pleasing sort of tannins, very silky, very smooth, uh, really, really, really beautiful wine. Um, I think it's about this time normally Sam's getting hungry and asking me about food. Uh, so I'm going to beat him to it. And I'm, I'm already thinking about some nice sort of, you know, something in like pot roasted pigeon or maybe some comfy pigeon legs just to um, enjoy with that. And um, yeah, no, beautiful, beautiful wine. Um, cool. Should we, Sam, any other? No, nope, keep going. Sorry, back on you. Yes, no, please do crack on being Stefan Mannion again and we'll get as much time from <laughs> Dan Romero as, as we can. Exactly. More, more, more time than the Indeed. I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, so next, the next wine is a Premier Cru. Uh, I think Stefan Mannion, great winemaker, uh, took over from his father back in 08. Uh, in, Burgundy, in Burgundy in terms already, there are a lot, lot of smaller holdings, but it's only at four hectare property with some really lovely holdings, some nice premier crews, bit of Grand Cru, close to Denise and Charm Chambertin. So uh, lovely, lovely guy. Stefan, very discreet, uh, very quiet sort of guy. Um, 
this particular vineyard is quite interesting. Les Sanchez, it's not a, it's not a famous vineyard, but actually in terms of its situation and it's, it's very interesting. It just sits below the bar, slightly different aspect. Uh, maybe not so much red soil, a bit more uh, brown uh, topsoil with stones, but a very very good piece of terroir. Uh, and the other thing this year, sadly for Stefan, was that he's about fifty percent down, so quite quite low in uh, production. So that's always tough for the winemakers when they when they get hit that hard. Um, yeah, so let's let's have a taste. Jared, from your visit there, you were torn on whether it's a consistent vintage or you were just tasting at the grape domains. Um, having done a few more Zooms, tasted a few more wines, have you firmed up your thoughts? Is, is it a consistent village vintage or, or are you just is, privileged? Uh, I think tasting this, I mean, I was lucky enough to try a 14 Sancier on Friday with some friends and it was, it, it was really great. And I think this 19 is even maybe a, in terms of that potential, maybe even a, a, above that. It's sort of, and everything you'd want from a Premier Cru Chambon in terms of there's that, those layers, the, the intensity. Uh, in terms of 19 overall, Sam, I, I mean, obviously I'm biased, but I think that we're potentially working with lots of best winemakers in Burgundy, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not slumming it when I do taste things. But, um, but yeah, I think, I think 19s are wonderful. I think that for Burgundy lovers who are maybe afraid because of heat or the, the dryness, I don't think there's anything to be afraid of. I think that, yeah, for sure, there's the odd wine that's maybe a percentage or half percentage more than we might expect, particularly in some of the whites, but they have such great pHs, acidity levels, you know, the, it carries it through, you don't even feel it. So it's, um, um, yeah, I think that definitely 19s, I'm going to try and, yeah, have a few from my own cellar. I think they're going to, and I think it'll be, it'll be interesting watching them develop. And uh, and some of the wines we tried the other night, I mean, there was, yeah, the, the Malcolm Sore was amazing. There was some, oh. you know, so, yeah, a real, I think, yeah, 19s, for me, was, Certainly in the youth, one of the best vintages trying them at this age in terms of just, I can really see the picture and, 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 and it's a good one. Thanks, Graham. Uh, Cyprian, if I may bring you in here now, and we, we're, we're tasting some Sontier, and I, I know you also work with, with that vineyard. So if we can lead into a little a couple of words about Sontier, and then we'll move on to uh, the, the Maury Chezzo of yours we have in front of us. Um, yeah, Jason always talked to me about an early declaration of how good a vintage is, but you have gone on the record to, to be very keen on this vintage. You, 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 you rate it extremely highly. Um, yeah, please let us know your thoughts. Yeah, okay, so um, very pleased to be uh, with all of you tonight. My, my accent won't, won't be as good as all of you. <laughs> Mine would be a Burgundian one. So um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I heard uh, so far very, very good uh, things about the, the vintage. Uh, most were uh, very true because it's uh, it's definitely a great vintage 19. We were talking about the Sentier. Sentier is uh, is uh, I make Sentier, but I will say Sentier is one of the very uh, top uh, clima of Burgundy. Um, it's just below uh, Bonne Mar. It's the premier cru of Chambord, which, which is the more north limit with uh, Maurice Saint Denis. So you, and it's a larger, it's a larger premier cru. So you can have inside of Sentier uh, some characters, uh, maybe uh, more from the Clota or the Bonne Mar with the masculine part of Chambord. Um, but it's it's definitely uh, one of the characteristic characteristic of the Sentier, and uh, it's very uh, very bright in nineteen. Is the um, the limestone of the place. Can, you can really feel the, the length of, of this wine, which I really like because you have the, the, the texture, the, the ripeness of the fruit at Chambord with the length of a, a wine with the limestone is, is not very far. So Sentier is, a, is an amazing uh, uh, spot, definitely. So maybe I can tell, uh, say a few, few words about the domain. Uh, so uh, I'm like Mark, I'm making wine for, for 20 years. Uh, most of my vintage have, have been done in Burgundy. I only made two vintages uh, over Burgundy, one in South Africa and one in New Zealand. But 
the 22 others that they've made in, in Burgundy. And it's, uh, it's important because you, you, never, you never know and you never uh, know everything. Uh, and uh, 18 was a good example of uh, uh, vintage I, I never seen before. Uh, but 19, uh, I had the feeling with the 19, to, as, as I heard, uh, to be really in Burgundy. Uh, it's true then for uh, uh, five years now, we, we have the, the climate change. Uh, it's, it's an evidence um, and uh, things are, are changing well in, also in, in Burgundy. But uh, inside those uh, change of, of weathers, uh, 19 uh, is really Burgundy. It has this brightness, this balance, this fluidity in the, into the wine. Uh, of course, the wine, they're ripe, but they're also very, uh, very fresh, um, very well balanced. Uh, and as you say, it's remind me uh, very much uh, the, the evidence in the wine of, uh, of 2010. It was a very different vintage because it was a cooler vintage. Uh, but in the wine, you have the same, um, uh, yeah, same, uh, pleasure, some uh, um, evidence, one more time, but fluidity into the wine, which makes, in fact, all the, the, the what we we'll expect from the Pinot to be, and maybe from Burgundy to be. Uh, it's true, inside of the vintage, you, you can have different experiences, because the farming was very important. Uh, and uh, it's true that on the domain, uh, it's a great help uh, to be uh, now uh, organic and biodynamic certified, when I moved to, to this farming uh, more than 15 years ago, I will not uh, think that it will be a great help with the climate change. But it brings uh, more, uh, more cooler characters into the wine, which we are looking for, because it will be the next challenge for Burgundy with those uh, climate change, will be to keep this expression of the place, the, the expression of the clima. Uh, and it's true when we get a, wa a warmer weather, uh, the Pinot Noir, is, uh, the hair toll is, is increasing. So if you find the keys uh, to farm your vineyards uh, with um, many, many techniques, but to make the vines with the roots very deep, uh, you, get, uh, you get a good balance into the wine and you, you skip the, the weather. So, uh, so the Chozo, uh, we, we're testing tonight, uh, the, Ch the Chozo uh, 19. So if I well heard, with the, we, we ever had a Chambol uh, et Chozo, and this wine is, is a Moret Premier Cru au Chozo. So it's a limit, uh, north limit of Moret. It's just next to Mazoyer. And au Chozo, the meaning of au Chozo, uh, it's the term was used uh, for every, Every place is like Echozo and Grand Echozo and, and other places in Chambol and, and Gevray, and this one is in Moray. But Ochozo means uh, uh, the antique uh, Roman ruin. Uh, you can find in those places. So it's, there is a heaps of limestone. The limestone is, is very young underneath. There is not a very thick uh, part of earth. Um, Chozo is, uh, is exposed to the cooler wind of the north, and it was, it was uh, very helpful in, in 19 because the wine has, uh, has a big ripeness, uh, uh, some pepperness, some, some spice, but um, it's still also very fresh and, and very balanced, and also with, with some floral characters, which for me, the characteristic of, of a nice, uh, very nice vintage of, of Burgundy. So in 19, you have uh, in this Moray Premier Cru Chozo, you have the, the expression of, of a ripe, generous, um, rich uh, vintage. And at the same time, you have this uh, freshness, this complexity of the perfume of a cooler vintage. So it's pretty rare, it's pretty rare. So 19, for me, I'm not superstitious, but I started the Friday 13 of September, and uh, I have to say that it, it's a good vintage. It's a vintage with, uh, with a, a nine, uh, number nine. But uh, the 2009 for me was more uh, opulent, it was a more opulent wine. Uh, 19 for me has much more, much more of uh, the great uh, vintage of Burgundy we can expect to age well uh, and to test uh, always in, in the good moon. 
uh, good mood. So, so uh, I, I've got. I will say this: uh, this vintage we will promise great, uh, great pleasure, great experience, uh, respect uh, very well uh, any any places. Uh, but one more time, it's true. It's very important to 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 trust uh, uh, like uh, a good wine merchant like Stanley because the selection is important. It's true. It, it would be it would be more and more important because with the climate change, it's very important to 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 be very precise, very, very precise uh, in your selection, of course, but I mean, for the, for, for the winemaker, for the wine growers, uh, you have to pick the, the grapes, you have to farm well, you have to pick the grapes at the right time. Uh, and, and we're playing with the, uh, we're playing on the, uh, with the limit. And it's what the great things with 19, the 19 have this kind of, uh, uh, you, you can very easily fall down but as long as you stay on the on the on the top, it's a great, it's a great great uh, vintage. So was it a difficult vintage to get the picking date right? Was it or was it obvious to you? I, I think so. I mean, uh, it was it was uh, as Mark say, it was it was um, less complex than than hating. It was it was easy to to test the grapes and to think like you have to be there at, at this time, but. From one day to the other, you, you can you can you can uh, you can lose the uh, the perfect balance. So it's becoming more and more complicated to be at the right time and at the right place, because 20 years ago in Burgundy the the ripeness of the fruit was very slow, and uh, in one week you would get a maximum of half a percent of alcohol into the wine. It was not the case uh, in South Africa. Like in three days, you can get uh, you can get one percent of alcohol now. It's coming into Burgundy uh, slowly. So depending of your farming, uh, of course, uh, we're lucky because the vines are not irrigated. So the roots, they're deeper than uh, vineyards comparing with the vineyards will be irrigated. So the, the, the weight of the, of the warmness, of the dryness uh, will affect less the vines. Uh, but slowly, if you, I mean, if you, if you had grown your vineyards uh, with fertilizer and with the clone, like William said, uh, you can increase the effect of the weather. So all the, the work of the of the of a, a Burgundian winemaker, uh, wine farmer, is now to always been like that, but more and more is to connect the vines with the place and to try to disconnect the vines uh, from from the heat. And when you can get that, uh, and you can get that in nineteen. The result is just uh, amazing. And, and Chezo, some of the vineyards you work with are older vines. Are Chezo's slightly younger? How old are the vines with Chezo? Yeah. No, they're, they're, they're just past 40, 40 years ago. Uh, okay. Not, yeah. They, 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 it's coming. It's coming. But, uh, <laughs> I've seen this wine uh, in 20 years. I've seen this wine, uh, the, the quality of this wine increasing. Also, with, uh, you know, uh, I, I like to say in Burgundy, there's nothing natural. Even if you are uh, biodynamic, there's nothing is natural. Behind there is there is a winemaker, there is a there is a spirit, there is human who want to build the wine, build the place. So um, with the Chozo, it's always a place uh, I trust a lot. Uh, there's 20 Premier Cru in Maurice and Lee. Many they're not known, and the Ochozo, we may be two, three producers. So I wanted this wine to be one day. A, a nice wine and um, with the horse growing with the farming and of course with the hedge with the years uh, the vine is getting older now and uh, I think it's, yeah it's probably it's probably my best more uh, I shows I ever made in 19. Fantastic. Ian's comment, extraordinarily, the way the tannins are here are wrapped in spicy fruit. I mean we, we, we did a, a zoom earlier in the year on, on what what is distinctive about about Mori, and we talked about that. Spice is an element you would you would highlight. The 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 the, the, the spiciness is we we limit with Gervais. So the Oshozo is having a, a bit of this spiciness, which which is probably for me not the 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 first characteristic of Mori, but it has a, a ripe fruit, and, and Mori for me uh, always had this uh, ripe fruit characters. Thank you very much, Cyprian. Keep firing the questions in. Um, Garrett, if I can throw one at you that's come in, just asking 
about the the three styles of the three the styles of the three shumble. Gerard, what would your thoughts be on that one? Yeah, so, well, obviously, I think qualitatively all very, very good, but maybe as maybe what uh, Cyprian's just uh, alluded to, some influence from the winemakers, what, how, they're, how they're handling the fruit, picking dates, um, I think uh, Marx, uh, Les Eches Um And can I just say to my Burgundian uh, friends on here, when we've already got Eches Grand Cruise, why do we need Lyodis with Eches And anyway, that's another, to make more complicated than the already complicated burgundy world but um yeah i think uh, marx lays this so and as, as he described it as you know very beautiful you know expressive and just very charming already i think um Thibault's wine was maybe more structured more intense maybe a, a little less easy to get into straight away and then but it, again showing that old vine characteristic something something quite intense um and then les sentiers which i Again, Cyprian was talking about it. I think it's, it's a wonderful terroir. Um, and I think that that's got layers and it's got time to time to grow and we'll, 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 we'll show off. But you can, I think what is the common theme is that you can, you can see the wines. You can see the, you, you, you can see the quality. You can see the vintage talking. And, and I think that, yeah, there are, there, there's different stylistically, but that's, that's always going to happen because they're coming from different, different vineyards and then the winemaker adding their, their touch in the, like a shape for the seasoning, you know? Thank you, Garrett. I'm desperate to bring Roma in. Hello, Roma. Please. Welcome. Nice to see you. Um, if I can throw a couple of questions in at you in an introduction and talk about some of the wines. Uh, Andrew's interested in, in hearing some thoughts on clones and Sarah, aside from global warming uh, and stems, other topics in Burgundy that are at the forefront of your mind. Sorry, is that the question that you're asking for? It was multiple questions. It was okay. as, a, as an introduction to 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 top uh, to top and a merm, uh, okay. to talk about Riot, and right. I was asking about uh, following following on Andrew's question about clones. Okay, so I, I would say that this simple comment. I think we we've never made such beautiful wines over the last years, and uh, despite the fact that we're talking about global warming evolution. I think the level of the, the quality of the fruits have never been so ripe uh, uh, and, and mostly downs. So we are probably making beautiful wine, great wines. If you compare to 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we did not necessarily reach the same level of ripeness in terms of the fruits when we picked the fruits. And if you take the example of 99 and put it back in 03, I think we will not necessarily get as much acidity as we would get nowadays. Uh, th there are simply some, some, uh, some things behind as well. Uh, we probably uh, got conscious, uh, I would say 25, 30 years ago, that we are bringing a lot of potassium in the, in the vineyards. So that has lowered the acidity of the soil, uh, which has lowered the acidity of the soil. And since that time, we have really, really reduced and even stopped the, uh, the, the bring of potassium in the vineyards. So progressively, the vineyards, uh, the earth has gained in terms of acidity. So I would say that nowadays, you know, the, uh, the vineyards uh, is getting more uh, acid out of the, uh, out of the soil uh, because the, the earth has gained more balance and more acidity. And uh, this is one of the reasons as well, I presume that you know, you're getting nowadays with a, 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 a vintage, which is very hot, uh, like 19. Uh, I recall we have four to five weeks in a row where temperature were ranking between 35 and 40 degrees Celsius. So it's never happened before. You know, even when we were talking about 76, 76 was really a warm vintage in Burgundy. But we recalled about only 33 degrees at maximum. You know, so there is a big gap uh, over the last uh, recent years and compared to what happened 20 to 30 years ago. Yeah. And I think, so the, the, the stop of bringing uh, a, a potassium to the soil is one part of the fact that the soil has, has bring it with more acidity and that you can find wine with more acidity nowadays, whereas at the same times, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the, the climate is quite warm and 
and, uh, and, and sometimes quite uh, hydric. You have a hydric stress as well. Um, the, um, the clones, um, I think we, we have been started again at the domain to uh, work on massile selection uh, and to, to try a different way to really adapt the rootstock according not only to the parcel itself, but the type of soil that you even have in terms of the parcel. Uh, because with the, uh, with the global warming evolution, uh, we have really noticed recently that we've got some problem, some issue with one of the rootstock, which is the uh, 16149. And you know, the, uh, the, uh, the roots are starting to, uh, I don't know how to say that in English, but uh, they are starting to, to get uh, uh, closed and the, uh, the, the vine is dying quite rapidly. So, you know, uh, working on, on the rootstock uh, 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 and, and uh, a massile selection is one of the way to diversify the, uh, your, your vineyards and, uh, and ease uh, the, the vine to resist as well more to an evolution of global warming. So I don't know if I really answered the, the question. I, I probably took a lot of time. Uh, I don't know if I was very clear on the, on the uh, acidity aspect from the soil, but I think that's one of the things. And the other thing is that the plant it's like human being is quite adapting the evolution of global warming as well. But there would certainly be a limit because, you know, uh, what, what, what I was really a bit suspicious at the beginning about 19 is, as I said, this was the highest, the, the, uh, the warmest vintage we ever encountered so far. And uh, uh, my worries were that, you know, uh, we, we would have reached quite high level of alcohol. My, my wines ended up between 13 and 14.5. And uh, so would we have sufficient freshness and acidity to balance the wines that are quite high level of alcohol? So that was a key question after all. And finally, as, as everybody said it here, uh, this is a, a vintage that's turned out to be really balanced with nice freshness. This is not the acidity of the 08 for sure, uh, but uh, you know there's a, a kind of of, uh, of sweet character uh, as 15 got as William pointed out, and I would dare that there are some 16, not uh, not necessarily 10, but a little of the 16 because of the level of acidity. It's not as acid as 16, but it has the same you know way of being quite acid, not too acid, and, and uh, as well uh, quite, uh, uh, quite sweet in terms of character by the end. And, uh, and the fruit are very uh, precise. Uh, you don't have any overripe fruit uh, character in the, uh, in the uh, 19 overall. And, and this is a vintage which is quite precise in terms of terroir definition as well. So, um, um, this was a big surprise. For me, uh, 17 was also a big surprise because I was wondering if 17 would have the fleshiness that we would have expecting, but fleshiness, we gained it when the uh, mallow went over. So we started to gain in terms of flesh in the 17th character. And on the 19th, I think we've got lots of acidity that we would not necessarily suspect at the beginning. Thing is, like in warm vintage, you have low level of malic acid. So from the beginning, when you have a certain level of acidity, you keep quite the same level of acidity till the end of the mellow because you have a low level of malic acid. So in fact, by the end, you, you get this nice balance between the acid that brings the freshness to the wine and the, uh, and the fact that you are able to pick ripe fruits that delivered you bright freshness, nice purity in the wines. So I think, yes, this, this is a vintage that is, uh, that is showing uh, really well. And um, if you would ask the question 10 years ago, I would not necessarily suspect that we would reach such a good quality of, 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 vin of wine for this kind of, uh, of vintage, actually. You say, Romain, it's, it's a vintage of terroir definition. Could I ask you to tell us a little bit about Riot? Yes, the, so the Riot, this is, this is a vine which is located just below the, uh, the Clos and Nis. And um, this is typically a vineyards that hardly suffered from hydric stress. 
because the the um, this is a very deep soil uh, you probably have uh, I'm ending up uh, um, uh, a study now there's a, of an audit of terroir and I've been uh, making some uh, thing some force I don't know how you say that and you, you could see that in Riot you go down to about uh, 1.10 meters and have finding uh, lots of clay and some uh, and some stone inside, uh, which is coming from the erosion of the uh, of the Combe de Moray, and uh, so this this soil is is quite deep and there is a high uh, hydric reserve, so that the uh, the vine uh, hardly suffer from hydric stress. So both in nineteen and twenty, this vineyards hardly show any hydric stress. So you could see only few leaves that started to turn yellow and hardly some that fall down. And um, so this, this is quite important. This is very coming out from very old vines, vines that are uh, above 60, uh, 60 years. And, um, and so the, the old vine plus the, uh, the fact that it's on the, on the soil, which is uh, uh, very deep and with lots of clay, uh, makes wine. There are uh, where I would say you have never reached such high level of of, uh, of ripeness in terms of the tannins. So I think ten years ago, uh, the wines, the Moray, La Riot, uh, probably show nice character, but the level, of the definition of the tannins were not necessarily as ripe as the one you could find uh, over the recent years. And the, uh, the more wines, uh, it's true that you cannot generalize because it's mainly depend on the type of soil, the age of the vine, and especially in vintages like 19. Uh, but the, uh, I would say that more wine uh, really benefited from the evolution of global warming, just because you know the, the quality of the level of tannins have been really uh, evolving in, in, in a more refined way. Uh, so I think that's the same thing also for the ones coming out from Missan um, Loge. What, what was the picking date for the Riot? And was that an easy decision? Um, I think, you know, in, in 1920, uh, uh, this was not necessarily easy decision for me. And I think that, you know, if you recall five to 10 years before, Decisions were very easy, you know. You you have a, an order of the picking, uh, which were quite almost the same, you know. I usually started with Corton, then I went with uh, La Condoro, then with uh, Nuit Saint Georges Premier Cru Le Collier, then with Chambord, then blah blah blah. And so the, the the order hardly changed. But over the last few years, as uh, as, uh, as a few pointed out, you know, the, uh, the order might have changed radically uh, because, you know, there have been some villages that got more rainfall. Uh, you know, you've got some, some, uh, some uh, vineyards where the soil is quite different. So you, you could change radically the order of the picking. And as uh, Cyprien pointed out, the evolution of the ripeness in 19 was really quick, like in 20. So you could reach about easily, about a degree of alcohol within about five to six days. Whereas as he pointed out, usually before that, it, it takes about a week to, to gain about half a degree of alcohol. So alcohol is not the only key thing, but you could see that the, the evolution of the ripeness of the seeds was very, very rapid as well. So, so you, you have to be really, curate very precise and uh, and uh, to to make a, a, a decision of the date and uh, in uh, in 19 uh, Marriott was the third vintage uh, for third uh, vineyards that I uh, harvested so it was on the uh, on the uh, on the 20th of uh, of September I started first in Corton, then waited for a few days, and then I started back in, uh, in, uh, in Côte d'Alene. Thank you. We're heading towards the hour mark, but William, if I can bring you back in again, if I may. Uh, Jason, a couple of people are testing your historic knowledge. Uh, vintages ending with nine. You're being asked to comment on 
gosh, where's the list there? Um, how does it fall within 09, 99, 89, 69, 59, and someone's thrown in 29? Yeah, there, there are a lot yeah. of good vintages ending in 59 in it. And it's true that a lot of them tend to be rather sunnier, raw, warmer, more sort of sumptuous, sumptuous years as, as well. So, so, I mean, it's not an entirely fatuous um, comparison. I guess you could say, uh, I think the, the, the wines have more um, energy and, and um, precision than 09s. You know, one comment that um, that uh, a winemaker once made to me about 09, it's a, it's a vintage with the flat electroencephalogram. You know, if it, it's super charming, super pleasant, delicious, but uh, lacks perhaps signs of life. The 2019s absolutely have signs of life, have, a, have energy, um, excitement, emotion, wines of emotion. Uh, clearly the tannins and also alcohol levels, I think, higher in um, 19 then in, then in 1999 uh, yields quite a bit lower in in uh, 2019 as well so I, I don't think there are too many points of comparison I know it, and it depends um, the, the I don't think the wine styles have, have much in common honestly if you if you compare you know if you want if you want to sort of do some of the great um, crew of the of the Cote de Nuit side by side it would be, be very fun in 10 years to do 1999 Latache next to 2019 Latache uh, but they're very different wines at the end of the day I think uh, going back further in time I mean I think I think 59 in a sense um, that there are there are points of comparison and this sort of sumptuous uh, expressiveness charm uh, combined at its best with vivacity analytically I'm sure they're very different uh, I think I think you know alcohols in in um, 19 are going to be a good percent higher on average, probably. Uh, but th there are certain points of comparison, I would say, between between 59. And certainly when people talk about 59, they talk about um, those wines being very charming straight out of the gates, which you couldn't say about a vintage such as 69, high, much higher in acidity, much more sort of tightly wound. There's still some 69s that are rather tightly wound today, in fact. Uh, and, I, and I don't think, you know, even 99s shut down. I don't, I don't see the sort of, the sort of quality of tannin and the, the, the chemistry of the wines, the, the profile of the wines uh, in 19, lending themselves to being wines that become very closed. I don't think we're not going to see them close down like 05, like some 15s have done. Um, I think they're going to get a, going to be expressive for, for very broad drinking, drinking windows, uh, which is part of the appeal of the vintage to me. Thank you very much. And, and we've, we've hit the hour and I'm going to draw a line on that note. Thank you very much to everyone. I will steal Mark's analogy. And I, I also feel that hosting a, a Chambol Mori tasting on a Thursday night, I am also the child in the sweet shop as well. So I hope everyone has enjoyed it. I have enormously and thank you to everyone.